This session number one is about megatrends and African security implications. So our objectives in this session, we hope to provide some understanding um, of the dynamics of major megatrends, things like urbanization, demographics, social change, the rising middle class, climate change, enabling technology, and of course pandemics, all things that are confronting African countries today. We hope to discuss the web of ever-changing security threats facing Africa and to understand the security implications of these different megatrends for leaders in the security sector. So I'm very pleased to have with us today two esteemed panelists, one who's joining us in person and another who will be joining us online. So let me present you their bios. Our first panelist will be Dr. Aloysius Uche Ordu. He is a senior fellow and director of the African Growth Initiative in the Global Economy and Development Program at the Brookings Institution, think tank here in Washington, D.C. Prior to taking up this appointment, he was managing partner at Omapu Associates LLC, a boutique advisory services and consulting firm. In that capacity, he was a lead advisor of the African Development Fund Policy Innovation Lab, which was created under the Bill and Melinda Gates Trust Fund to support the efforts of the African Development Bank Group for reinvigorating concessional finance to respond to the changing reality of its clients. As lead advisor, he oversaw a policy team that prepared the report of the high-level panel on transforming trust in the African Development Bank Group into influence. Dr. Ordu was previously vice president at the African Development Bank. Before his appointment um, there, he was regional director for Eastern Africa, covering Burundi, Kenya, Rwanda, Seychelles, Tanzania, and Uganda. In that capacity, he introduced innovations in country strategy formulations, analytically rigorous economic and sector work, and attention to expeditious portfolio management and quality assurance. And finally, before joining the African Development Bank, Dr. Ordu worked at the World Bank for over two decades and served in various leadership and managerial capacities. So welcome to Dr. Ordu. We are also joined online by someone you've met already this morning, Dr. Luca Byung Dang Kool. He is an independent consultant and an adjunct distinguished professor of African Security Studies here with us at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. His areas of expertise include development, security, and governance nexus, public policy design, implementation, and evaluation, national security strategy development and implementation in Africa, and the management of security resources in Africa. He is also a global fellow at the Peace Research Institute for, in Oslo, a fellow at the Rift Valley Institute, and an associate professor of economics on leave at the University of Juba in South Sudan, amongst many other distinguished uh, titles that he has. He was the Dean of Faculty and Academic Affairs at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies until quite recently. And he was faculty lead on three of our key academic programs you will have the chance to learn about here over the next two weeks. National Security Strategy Development and Implementation in Africa, Managing Security Resources in Africa, and Emerging Security Sector Leaders in Africa, which he is still very critically involved with, as you see from the prior proceedings today. With that, I think we will turn to Dr. Ordu. Um, I asked Dr. Ordu um, to talk about um, a really important report that the Brookings Institution's Africa Growth Initiative has put out. It's called the Foresight Africa Report 2022. And so we are hoping that Dr. Ordu will spend 15 or 20 minutes talking about um, how to foresee some of the key megatrends in Africa, particularly <coughs> demographic change, climate change, technological innovation, he was editor of this report, so we hope he will explain some of the dynamics and trends affecting the African continent, what some of the security implications might be. And the Foresight Africa report came with a hopeful message and cautious optimism about Africa's future. So um, we would like to get a sense from you, Dr. Orton, what you think African leaders should do now in terms of responses um, to these megatrends um, that would help to advance African security interests. So with that, I'll give you the floor for 15 to 20 minutes before we turn to Dr. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I was just telling uh, Joel and Catherine that um, I've 
walked around this area before, but I had no idea of the tremendous real estate inside here in terms of uh, the university. And so it's great to actually enter for once. And I'm glad to see so many, so many faces from the continent. Uh, <clears throat> I just came back myself uh, two days ago and I informed you well that if I look a little bit tired, it's because I've been traveling around the continent for the last uh, three weeks, actually. So as mentioned, I will um, basically give you a sense very quickly of um, what's in the report, which will be, I'll go through a couple of slides, which will be shown in a minute. And um, the thing to bear in mind is basically that every year since 2011, the Africa Growth Initiative at Brookings had issued uh, Foresight Africa um, for the year ahead. And what happens basically is that um, we don't sit in Washington and tell us Africans what the top priorities for our continent should be. We actually use and um, uh, uh, consult presidents, captains of industry, youths, women groups, scholars, etc., from across the continent to basically provide us with viewpoints of their own thoughts of what the priority ahead would be like. I wish I had um, uh, the opportunity to bring you more copies, but um, I have left just a few with uh, Catherine and uh, Joelle. And um, for those who are interested in pursuing this further, please, uh, at Brookings Institution, our website will basically be uh, you can download the report from there. For this year's report, 2022, we focus basically on six thematic areas. And these thematic areas were basically areas that across the continent, people informed us that these are the areas of uh, priorities uh, for the continent to focus on. I've just come back from Dakar, uh, uh, Accra, Lome, Nairobi, and of course uh, Kigali and, um, and Kampala. Um, this will launch in this report. And as we launch this year, we're also asking the audience, just like I'm going to ask you now, you know, from your point of view as officers and distinguished uh, people in various uh, walks of life, where you come from, uh, what would be useful is also to get from you a sense of what you think ought to be the priority for our continent in the year ahead, because we'll be producing this report again in January 2023. So it's important that you also get your voices heard and uh, contribute to uh, our dialogue. So for this report, 2022, the focus is really on just these six areas. Clearly, the economic recovery of our continent is priority number one, and so particularly financing uh, a post-COVID uh, recovery of the continent. Chapter two deals also with public health because clearly we are struck by the twin challenge of both uh, economic collapse in some communities, economic and financial, and of course health, health challenges. And then the third area covered in terms of themes is African women and girls leading the country. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Climate change was specifically referred to. Uh, if there was ever a mega trend facing our continent, clearly this is one of them. And then the technological innovations in terms of clear, uh, creating and harnessing uh, tools for improved livelihoods on our continent would be important. And then finally, a sixth theme which is this whole notion of Africa's external relations. How do we reinvigorate and uh, pursue new partnerships? And we'll see why that is important. Next slide, please. So this slide, basically, we asked uh, my friend and brother, Marta Diop, who's now the managing director of the uh, IFC at the World Bank. And Marta and I go way back. And we all joined the World Bank around 1988 and uh, worked for quite a long time before I retired from the World Bank. But we asked him basically to take a look in terms of ahead on the continent. From his perspective, he used to be vice president for Africa region, he used to be director for Kenya, etc., etc., and now managing director of the IFC. And he made it very, very clear that to recover from where we are as a continent, there are a number of things that are absolutely fundamental. 
Building infrastructure remains key, and I 100% agree with that. As Vice President of the African Development Bank, many of you will know that in your countries, the African Development Bank is a major, major investor in infrastructure. And supporting small businesses is important, and increased trade as well, trade finance in particular. And the graph in front of you just shows that until the pandemic itself, one region of the world that was doing exceptionally well was the African continent, in the sense of the narrative of the Africa rising, which many of you have heard. And even when COVID hit, you could see that one continent did not quite, uh, everybody predicted it would decimate Africa, it didn't. Actually, the growth decline in Africa was only 1.9%. Many places, growth fell dramatically, as that picture showed. And until recently, Russia and Ukraine, which we'll go into in a minute, the expectations from both the African Development Bank, the World Bank, the IMF, and many of these entities was basically that Africa will come out of this growing at about 3.4, 3.6%. But of course, our world has changed inextricably since the previous report. Next slide, please. This slide really gives you a sense of the sources of development financing on the continent. Uh, portfolio flows, foreign direct investment, remittances, they are all very important. But I'm going to focus on Overseas Development Assistance, ODA, which is a major part, as you can see, it's the largest share of uh, finance, development financing on our continent. What is happening now is important as you also go back home to emphasize the message here. And the message here is very, very simple. And that is that Overseas development, as an ODA, as we knew it, is severely constrained. Let me repeat that. ODA is not going to be available as it used to in the, in the past. Why? All the sources of ODA, the countries, the donor countries, are themselves fiscally challenged at home because of COVID, because of all the things happening. Plus, Russian invasion of Ukraine means that when all this devastation of Ukrainian cities are over, somebody is going to have to write checks to rehabilitate and reconstruct Ukraine. And the same donor countries that give us ODA, you can already begin to guess where would the money go. The money will go definitely first to Ukraine. So, as we look forward in terms of trends, the decline in ODA facing us is going to be really, really far much more than we've ever noticed. That's a very important message to carry on. All right? Because the, either the low income window of the World Bank mobilized 93 billion last year during the replacement of the 20th uh, either, and either had a straight wrong way, there was nobody else replenishing. This year, our bank, the African Development Bank, is replenishing. And already, a constricted runway is what they face. Because the same donors who write the checks are not going to uh, write as much checks as they used to in the past. Trust me, I used to actually, as VP of the African Development Bank, lead the replenishment effort. So this is not a year to be replenishing, but still, this is where we are. Next slide, please. So in terms of economic recovery, then, we asked the president of Zambia, uh, um, President uh, Hakinde Itadema, to basically, as the new, remember, he lost elections five times, and the sixth time he came to he won, and won decisively, a private sector guy who had made it in the private sector. So we basically approached him and asked him to articulate what's his agenda for action for our people in Zambia. And look what he had to say. As far as he's concerned, Democratic transition is key, creating jobs, addressing the obstacles in the mining sector, and making it easier, not harder, easier for small businesses to gain access to capital. If you delete Gambia, Zambia and add any other African country, I can show you that what the president said applies to all our countries. Okay? So it's important, therefore, to pay heed to what um, people like uh, President Hitler is saying because he knows he's used his money to create jobs before when he was um, a, a, a private sector corporate leader. So that's very quickly because um, both Joel and 
Catherine informed me of the, the, the time. So let's, in chapter two, which will not surprise you, public health, ensuring equal access and self-sufficiency is what you will find when you read that chapter. Here, the message is very, very clear. And that is, when push comes to shove, we Africans were on our own. Why do I say that? Because when COVID hit, everybody, everybody was hoarding vaccines. Never before have we seen a polarized world. The world of the rich and vaccinated and poor and unvaccinated. But you know what was very important about that world? The Africans had mobilized. $4 billion. The Africans had assembled the best and brightest of the continent. There are some, you know, Strive uh, uh, from Zimbabwe, uh, uh, Dono Kaburuka, my former boss and friend from former president of African Development, and many others, to basically mobilize Africans. We were meeting every Wednesday with finance ministers and public health ministers. Africa was ready to buy parts. Nobody was selling. Most countries hoarded vaccine eight times their population. So the message is very, very clear that when push comes to shove, we are now home. And that's why it's important when ODA is declining and we're not able to access uh, pop, you know, ther uh, therapeutics and all the relevant uh, medicines that we need and vaccines. It's important, therefore, that we rethink our approach to public health at home. Okay, so these are very, very important messages because um, it does mean, therefore, that our approach to raising domestic revenues, tax money, becomes now even more important than ever before. So, uh, so basically, the vaccine inequity we saw was not the world of the past where you know, we all acted in unison. We all were very collaborative in our approaches. Uh, what we saw during COVID was a different world. A world that is fractured and remains fractured. A world where you can no longer be sure that, you know, the community of nations, when things hit, pandemic is something that hit all of us at the same time. And so if, we, if the world couldn't rally, to conquer a pandemic, it makes you wonder, when would we ever run it? So this is a very, very important message. Next slide, please. And that takes us to chapter three, where it's important, wherever you are heading back to, the issue of gender. When you think of African women in positions of trust and responsibility, you look around the world. My sister and friend from the World Bank, who is now WTO head, Mugazio Kondiwala. Number two at the United Nations, Amina Mohammed, another sister. There are some were mentioned in the UNECA, etc., etc. You see all these African women in positions of trust and responsibility globally, and you think, yeah, we've won the gender battle. Nothing could be further from the truth. We have a long way to go in terms of ensuring that women occupy their rightful place in our society. I'm actually really, really delighted as I look around this crowd that the gender balance here is really, um, I'll say not bad. <laughs> you know, so we have a long way to go. We really do. And so we asked our sister, Ellen, uh, former president of Liberia, Dr. Ellen uh, uh, Johnson Salif, uh, to basically share with us her own thoughts and she makes it very, very clear that our women and girls are achieving that the front line of peace and stability, uh, security, which are of concern to you, climate, gender, technology, etc. But the battle is far from won. We still have many, many of our young women and girls not um, basically uh, occupying positions in short. And if you think about it, just reflect on all your teachers since we're in an academic setting. All your teachers, all the way to university, start thinking how many of the you know, professors that taught you at university were actually women. How many deans were women? Then you begin to 
reflect that we really, really have a long way to go, even uh, uh, in the issue of um, uh, um, academic pursuit and where women's role occupy. Transitioning very quickly to climate change. Now, this is one of those areas that, to call it a mega trend, I mean, if, if there was ever one, this, this is it. Right? And a couple of things here, because for security reasons, what is beginning to happen, as you would all, I hope, will agree, is that on our continent, we have certain old certainties. When I was growing up in the Delta of Nigeria, we used to look up in the Nigerian map and see the Sahara Desert, followed by the savannah, before you go down. Now, there is no difference between Sahara and Savannah. The desert is encroaching absolutely unrelentlessly. So that's, combine that with the nexus of insecurity in that area, it gives climate a different dimension in terms of thinking of climate change. You go to the Horn of Africa, the number of cattle dying in the countries of the Horn is just unbelievable. Northern Mozambique, you have a confluence of factors that again, inspired by climate, but then the insecurity that goes with that makes climate change no longer something we, uh, it's not academic on our continent. And so this is one of those areas where we are, as Africans, not the cause of the warming of the planet. Our contribution is less than 1%. And yet the consequences are manifesting. If you're from Madagascar, what is happening in Madagascar is frightening, just like in northern Mozambique, just like in northern Nigeria, just like in the Sahara, and of course in, uh, in the Horn of Africa. So the climate issue is very, very, uh, very personal and very important. But on top of that also, the solution to the climate crisis is in Africa. Because one of the largest lungs of the world, the Congo Basin, is the second after the uh, Amazon Basin. But more importantly, the Congo DRC itself, I don't know how many of you have watched the movie Wakanda, you know, uh, um, you, you find that um, if the governance situation was different, Congo definitely ought to be a Wakanda because you name it, all the rare earths are there, the things we will need for, for, for uh, um, moving to electric cars, etc. So we have the solution, we're not the cause of the problem, and yet we are dramatically, dramatically suffering the consequences. Next two slides, please. So that takes us to technological innovations. And here, we have a mega trend in the sense that Africa's technological innovation, many of us argue, would be the solution to the future. Especially, especially since a large part of this is driven by our youths, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And so that brings me to the sixth and final chapter in Foresight Africa, the external relations in terms of reinvigorating and, and pursuing new partnerships. As we speak, on the 20th, two weeks from now, the Commonwealth is assembling in uh, Kigali. Right? And so that's old partnerships, US, America, Europe, etc. Make no mistakes, when you look at the new partners of Africa. The map, next, the map here shows very quickly, uh, chapter 6, please. Yeah. This map, you get a sense of who the new partners are. In the recent 10 years, Turkey alone has opened far more embassies on the African country than any other countries on the planet. You know, India making huge inroads, Brazil, uh, uh, Japan not to be outdone, Qatar, these are all countries really, really making inroads into the continent. The question I have for us, the policy makers in Africa, is our partnerships are changing, as demonstrated here. But are we changing the nature of what we do? Because you see, the old partnerships with Europe and America, what did we sell? 
basically raw materials. The new partnerships, what are we selling to them? Raw materials. Normally when things change, you should change and adapt. We're not doing that. Coco is a very good example. Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Nigeria. The cocoa business globally is $446 billion a year. And only $8 billion goes to West Africa. Because we export the beans, and then Belgium, Switzerland, etc., transform it to chocolate and all that. So they rip a huge chunk of the values from cocoa. And so unless we can actually adapt in this changing world, it's going to be very, very difficult going forward. As we go home and as people in positions of trust and responsibility, this slide I hope you don't forget. Of all world regions, none, none is growing exponentially as the African continent. Our youth board is such that the median age on our continent going for is 18 years. So this idea that the youth are our future, no, 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 no. The youth are the present. It means half the population are under 18 and half are over 18, compared to the United States, Europe, elsewhere, where 36 to 40 is the median age. So the demographic dividend on the continent is real, but it's also happening and being juxtaposed with technological innovation. And I believe that if you combine these two, we have the opportunity to dramatically raise living standards across our continent. But here's the thing. The dividend is not guaranteed at all. OK, next slide, please. It's not guaranteed because we need to empower our youths. We need to really build human capital. You know, access to education, focusing on the quality and outcomes of education. We need to enable these youths to have access to resources, inclusive college curriculum that will enable them to come out of school and apply for jobs and actually secure those jobs. There are also a, a huge cohort of Africa's youths, which if we're not careful, we will lose. And then those are the ones that require second chances. Charles Taylor, back in Liberia, Sierra Leone, the number of child soldiers, northern Uganda, etc. When these guys have actually, young people have shot and killed at 14 and 13 and 15, when they come back, how do we rehabilitate them? What of the 17 year old brilliant young girl who during COVID got pregnant? and cannot go back to school. How do we rehabilitate? So these are examples of second chances which we cannot afford to leave them behind because they are very, very important. And that's why, next slide please, in the uh, Brookings Institution, what we're trying to do now is basically to establish a go-to place, one-stop shop on Africa's youth, we're calling Africa's youth boys. The idea here is that if you want to know anything happening on the scene, as far as kids are concerned in Africa, you go to us, basically. And the idea basically is that um, you want to know what youths are doing in Burundi versus what youths are doing in Madagascar or in uh, Morocco, etc. You can actually manipulate the data yourself uh, uh, in an interactive fashion. Now, why is this important? This is really huge because Remember the 20th century, 19th century in particular. 12 million Africans were marched out of our continent, involuntarily as slaves, to Americas, to Europe, and elsewhere. Involuntarily, 12 million. Today, many African youths, able-bodied, are ending up in the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea on their way to Europe, where they actually not wanted not needed, at least as, you know, all to America, etc. And so we cannot afford this sort of voluntary migration. It means that we need to really do something at home, which we are not currently doing. We need to be very, you know, institute youth-friendly policies. We need to have infrastructure. There's no way youths can occupy the technological age 
if they can't even have electricity or broadband access. My final point. Silicon Valley, on my last visit, they recruit mostly IT skills from two countries on Earth. Number one, India. Number two, you guessed it, Ukraine. Ukraine, we know what is going on there. The question is, what of Africa's youth? We know what's happening in Yaba, Lagos. We know what's happening in Nairobi, in Kigali, in Cape Town. There's a lot of momentum in terms of youth and IT skills. But can they occupy those jobs in Silicon Valley? Remember, Silicon Valley doesn't even want you to come to California. They pay you eighty to $180,000 a month, I mean a year. But you stay home and work from home. How can you do that if you have no electricity? How can, our, our leaders even clued in to the fact that this is the future. So on that positive note, I'd like to thank you very, very much. Uh, because the future of our continent uh, is not, as they say, is to use our next generation. I want to basically share with you that right now, our youths are the current generation, and we need to really be sure and intentional in the way we, we, we make sure they get all the access to infrastructure and things. Thank you very much. So based on your wealth of experience, Dr. Luca, can you explain the dynamics and trends of climate change and migration in particular, and how those megatrends are interconnected? What are the security implications of these various megatrends that we're discussing on the panel today? How do they interact with security in Africa? And of course, what should African security sector leaders do now in terms of policy, institutional response, reforms that can help harness opportunities and mitigate challenges that these megatrends are posing? Uh, first, let me, as Dr. Kelly said, my intervention will will focus on the, the dynamics and trends of urbanization and migration and how they interacted. Uh, and then I may discuss a bit of the security implication of these mega trends. And the last is what should we do now in terms of leadership policy and in institutions? and possibly on issues of good governance. I think Dr. Otto uh, did a great job in terms of highlighting two important mega trends or three. I think what I would like to highlight first before I, uh, is that as you could see from this intervention and, and our presentation, it is extremely very important for the uh, you as emerging security sector leaders to be really knowledgeable of different disciplines. There, you need to be an economist, you need to be a, a demographer, you need to be a lawyer, you need to be a scientist, you need to be, because these are the quality of leader, because you need to have a bit of understanding. And I think we, we'll try to avoid the, the jargons here. So we'll be heavy loading you with some statistics, and I would like you really to be, to be with us about this statistic. Uh, this graph here, there's no way, I mean, there's no doubt that the, uh, there is a very convincing evidence that urbanization will be one of the most significant transformation in the 21st century, particularly in Africa. Just to give you a sense, and as you can see from this, this slide, 60% of the world population will live in cities by 2030. But indeed, 80% uh, of all urban growth in the next 20 years will take place in Africa and Asia. Uh, and as you can see from, from here, uh, since 1990 alone, the number of cities in Africa doubled from 3,300 to 7,600. And their cumulative population increased by 500 million people. In the same way, and you can see also from that graph, the, the, that slide, that the uh, 
since 1999 also, the urban population as a percentage of total population has almost doubled uh, from 27% in 1990, I mean, in 1990, 1990 to 41% in, two, to in two. A massive change is coming. And this is a real, a real, a real challenge to, to Africa. It provides opportunities and it provides also uh, security challenges. Uh, but one other thing I would like to share, that what are the, the driver of this urbanization, this rapid urbanization? When you compare Africa to Asia, the main drivers of Asian urbanization was really the demand for employment on basis of the opportunity created by industrialization in the cities. And this makes urbanization to be a, one of the key drivers of economic development in, in Asia. On the other hand, in Africa, urbanization was basically driven by the appalling rural livelihood conditions, such as poverty, food insecurity, and violent conflict that forced the rural population to move to the cities and those cities with limited employment opportunities, except in the informal sector. You could see the, uh, the change. And that is making urbanization becoming a concern uh, rather than becoming an engine for the, uh, for the development. Generally, and it has been argued by the Africa, African, uh, African Development Bank that, so, urbanization in Africa is actually unplanned, unregulated, and that resulted in over two thirds of the African urban population live in the informal settlement and make, as made, and some of I mean, the African development say said, what they call, they call or they describe the African urbanization as dysfunctional. But, the urbanization, this, this unorganized urbanization in Africa is a manifestation of leadership and governance deficit. And there are some countries on the continent that have succeeded in managing better urbanization and making it as a one of the driver for development, security, and stability. Besides the issues of governance, other factors like climate change, conflict, demographic change, have contributed considerably to the urbanization in Africa. I will just slowly, briefly talk about uh, migration. Migration is, is a, a global phenomenon that shapes and continues to shape human civilization and global stability. The countries we are talking about today, civilized, highly advanced, they come in, in being because of the migration. Economically, migration has a lot of dividends. And I think I guess I will highlight some of the points that I just mentioned. But generally the level and dynamics of migration in recent years, or I could say not only migration, including the whole displacement, have raised a global concern and posed a political instability and insecurity, particularly in the West. Just to use some of the statistics, my colleague, in the Africa Center, um, um, Wendy Williams, and uh, that the level of forcefully displaced people had generally increased in Africa, particularly the conflict um, uh, uh, IDPs. And you can see it from that. Uh, so if you could see from that, from that first, first uh, graph, you could see the, the major displacement is caused by conflict and internally displaced people. And, uh, and the population of refugees increased, but not in the same level of the, um, the IDPs, internally displaced people, while the population of asylum seekers is quite minimal. Just to clarify this point, and this is what uh, the glaring statistic provided by Wendy Williams, of 1.5 1, 1 million African displaced every year, 95% remain on the continent and 66% remain in their home countries. And 85 are coming from few countries that are affected by, by, by conflict. 
uh, such as uh, uh, South Sudan, the DRC, Somalia, Nigeria, Sudan, Somalia, uh, Ethiopia, the uh, Central African Republic, and Cameroon. While the number of migrants of, to Africa remains very low, especially the second graph, and it's stable, the number of migrants within Africa uh, is increasing and very high, reaching almost about 5, 50%. And the number of migrants from Africa has been increasing, but less than that of migrants within Africa. So these st statistics are very important. And they underscore one point that the migration is more of the Afri African problem. And it is not consistent with what has been projected. Uh, the next slide, especially the one can show you, and this, this is, I want to recognize a good work done by, I'm, I'm not bragging, but the Africa Center did a great job. Uh, I mean, in terms of putting infographic, just to, to reflect the level of, of, of this challenge, this issue of, uh, of migration. So the population of migrants within Africa, as you could see from of this, is about 21 million, which is 53% of the total. And the population of Af African migrants to Europe is about 11 million, which is about 28%, and, and to North Africa. And it is very interesting phenomenon that Africans are now even moving to North Africa. I mean, to North, uh, to North Africa uh, through, through uh, Southern Africa countries. And it's about 3 million, which is a very alarming number. It's about 66% of the total number of the, of the migrants. And even to the Middle East, uh, it's about 5%, which is 13% of the. So these statistics show again the issue of African migrants is a transnational issue, not only within the continent, but also outside the continent. And that I will echo again what uh, uh, Dr. Ordu uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, and then you could see in the second, in the second map, the, the dynamics of the root of the, uh, so it's, it's a very, a very big decisions by this migrant, the way they want to, to move within Africa and even outside Africa. But you could see a lot of trouble on the root of the, of the of movement uh, within, within Africa. I see, I just want to echo what, what, what Dr. Ordu mentioned, he, he showed graph, but then I want to use this graph. There's a lot of migration dividends. There's no doubt about it. Sometimes people talk about the dividends in terms of the recipient countries, but how they talk about the, the dividends in terms of the countries of origin. You could see from the first um, graph that the remittance flow to Africa have overtaken even the foreign direct investment and in official development assistance. And what the total said, it is true, the official development system is shrinking. Uh, but interestingly, if you look at the second, the second uh, graph, even the, the remittance flow are even overtaking the oil rent, and especially given our countries that are depending on this oil. Uh, and and that's, this, this is this, this, this. So, and there's a very communicative evidence that shows the remittance flow because we did some work, the limited flow to Africa are higher than the aggregate, aggregate revenues mobilized by and collected by the African countries. You can imagine, even to the level of the revenue envelope by some of these African countries, remittances are even higher than the, the locally mobilized resources by the government. So this statistic again show that the African diaspora are critical stakeholders in Africa. They are even more important than not only foreign direct investment, foreign private investors, or even donors, and even taxpayers in Africa. And whenever we talk about planning for Africa, we tend to forget this sector of the, of the, uh, of, of the, of the society. This one, this, what are the push and pull factors of migration? There are a lot of evidence, a lot of discussion, a lot of studies, a lot of studies. I was engaged in one way when, with, uh, with the World Food Program uh, to, to do the study about what are the drivers of the, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the migration. I don't want you to bother you with these graphs, with these statistics, 
But I want to make one point is that sometimes as African leaders, you need to understand how these economies, they try to, to use and to diagnose the, the, uh, the any phenomena in the country. Have a sense of how you can read some of these things. For example, when we talk about net migration, the net negative migration, we have found first some very important uh, insight here. There's this net migration. What is the impact of the previous migration on the current migration? And we found it to be really positively, positively related. And this has a lot to do of the linkage between the diaspora or those who migrated earlier and how they're connected in their home areas with the potential people to migrate. And that's they're sharing a lot of information, the route, the route of the of the migration, they share even the cost, and they share a lot of information. And that itself is actually helping more migration because of this special relationship between those who left and those who intended to leave the country. The second factor that we found very important, it is this the GDP gross, gross domestic product per capita and gross domestic gross. These are very important. On the one hand, if there's a very increased high income, these are good indicators for employment. So good, a high income is likely to help the, the, the migrant to take the decision to cover the costs and to move out of the country. But at the same time, we have found a high level of growth or economic growth is likely to provide more opportunities for employment and becoming one of the pull factors not to allow people to move outside the country. And this is a, has a lot of implication in terms of the year uh, of this, the importance of issue of employment as a key factor, as I think Dr. Arthur mentioned. Then we found a very clear case that the, uh, the population and population growth is actual is affecting also the I mean affecting positively the, the migration outside the country. A clear case which we was, we found very important is the issue of undernourishment, of which is an indicator for the food security. This is very significantly linked to the to the to the to, to, to migration. Uh, and, and then the incidence of armed conflict confirmed very well that is linked also to the uh, and this is about the whole lot of uh, uh, governance issues. And, but even the most important, the incidence of national disasters contributed also positively for the migration. As you could see from here, but the most important, even we try to, to look at the determinant of the eruption of civil war and, this, and, the, and the intensity and the duration of the civil war. And we found migration is one of the very important factors in terms of eruption, and then sustaining, and uh, so so these are some of the uh, some of the, uh, uh, the the drivers, uh, and there could be many other uh, other 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 uh, uh, other uh, factors that could be considered. Now, now the so 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 what we can what what we can say is that uh, so clearly. Economic development is a clear case of a pull factor, then you, but you have conflict, uh, uh, destitution, and then the, uh, the, the, the climate change are quite a very uh, 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 push factors for the migrant to, uh, I mean, for the increase in the migration. So what are the security implications? As you could see from these this, this graphs and images, this, you could see the uh, in terms of urbanization, and the photo the photo is really very telling. And as how can you have what the security challenges that could be posed by unplanned and unregulated urbanization? As I mentioned earlier, as over two thirds of African urban population we live in informal settlement, and this enforced informal settlement is ungoverned security space within the cities. And this will definitely provide a breeding ground for criminal actors and, and criminal markets. And also the, this informal settlement will provide a conducive environment for transnational organized crime, violent extremism and terrorism. 
and with increased access to information, the growing socioeconomic inequalities and corruption and disrespect to human rights and rule of law in the city will make this African urban population likely to demand for more transparency and accountability. Uh, sometimes through a peaceful protest, riots, and demonstration, as we are seeing on the continent. So this informal settlement of the African urban population will, will continue to pose a real challenge to the way African leaders would like to deliver safety and security to their citizens. Security implication of migration. The conflict IDPs will continue, will constitute the overall overwhelming majority of the forcible displaced population will pose safety and security challenges in the conflict affected countries. And this will create tension between the conflict affected communities and international community over issues of humanitarian access, denial and respect of human rights. But even for the refugees in the neighboring countries will pose security challenges to their country of origin as they are likely to support the insurgent forces or rebel movement because sometimes they provide logistics in terms of food aid and becoming a potential recruit uh, of, the, of, the, of the insurgents. And for the African migrant who succeeds to settle in the West or in the foreign countries, are likely to, 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 to pose security threat to the countries of origin, and they are more likely to mobilize the resources, including advocacy, to, post, to support opposition or rebel movement, to destroy the countries of origin. Studies have shown, especially by Paul Collier, that the diaspora contribute to the Arabian civil war, but they are also very instrumental in sustaining civil war and is sluggish in embracing reconciliation even after the peace agreement is signed. So African mig migrants are likely to become a source of insecurity if they are not positively engaged and as they have enormous resources in terms of finance, networking, information or even uh, to destabilize the countries of origin. So what can we do? I think this is a very big question. I want to highlight just a few points to conclude uh, uh, Dr. Kelly. One, in terms of leadership, I think it is very important for African leaders to provide a national vision uh, that will be a guidance of how to harness the opportunities availed by the mega trends and policies to address the challenges posed by the mega threat. So I think this uh, having a vision is really very, uh, very important. And, I, and, and there are abundant uh, national vision in Africa, but such visions are often articulated without the involvement of citizens. But we have a very, some of good example like Botswana, they have a vision uh, 2036, and Namibia vision 2030, and these visions they are articulated based on the on the on the uh, on the on the national values and the, the and the experiences. Uh, we I mean having a vision that is people centered and inclusive and engaging the citizen is extremely very important because these um, these mega trends need a collective action needs people to be part of this of this uh, this process. So having a vision is extremely very important. The second one the second in terms of governance and security sector. Really, because of this security challenge of, uh, posed by, by the megatrend, it is very important for the African countries to start having, a, there will be a demand for more accountability and more transparency for government and particular security sector. So then the challenge posed by this megatrend requires the urgent need to audit and review the capacities and competence of security institutions and agencies to address these security challenges. And, the, and this may require having what I, what I suggest, a need to security sector audit. And security reform is for all the countries. So audit understand what is happening, whether this security sector, they have adequate competencies, competencies and capacity to respond to these security challenges. In terms of policies, I, I think the African urban population and African migrants are national security concerns. And there's a need, there's an, and there's a need to be addressed within the overarching national security strategy. There is no doubt the current national security strategies or policies may not be adequate to address the security challenge posed by the mega threat. So developing 
an inclusive, people-centered, and participatory national security strategy will be urgent and extremely critical to guide the development of people-centered national urban infrastructure and diaspora policies. And this national security strategy will provide a rare opportunity for collective national analysis and risk assessment of the security challenges. And, and, um, and this will provide opportunity for the vision of labor, decision-making process, and effective coordination. And in terms of institutions, the, the role of police is becoming very clear now. These security challenges are going to impose on the law enforcement, particular police. And this will have, they will have a daunting task ahead. So in strengthening and building capacity of police to become people-centered, accountable, accountable public service will be essential for addressing the security challenges posed by the, the mega trend. And this will necessitate to focus the focus of community policing and in strengthening local and municipality authority to become a player in addressing the security challenges by the, uh, posed by these security, by the mega trend. Um, and building and strengthening analytical foresight and statistical capacity, statistical capacity will be critical to generate the much needed evidence to inform policy and plan to address these challenges. And the last one, but not least, leveraging partnership. I think it's extremely very important because the nature of the security threat posed by these mega trends are transnational in nature. And if there's a need for a collective action, and the countries should be able to leverage this partnership so that these countries, they, they, they need to support the African countries in addressing these mega trends. Some of these aids coming is not free, but if you have a very clear policy direction to, to, to guide this partnership to, come to, to align with your national interests and national ownership, then, that, that, then, then Africa country will be able to make use of the year. So Dr. Kelly, I don't know, maybe let me stop here and uh, really thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Luca, thank you again, Dr. Ordu. Um, as you all have heard, there are quite a range of different megatrends and uh, elements affecting African security futures.